All right, thanks for coming tonight. Everybody looks really excited. Uh, one drink in, feeling good? My name's Anthony. I am the community manager here at Starfish. So I help connect uh, people who are working here, people who want to work here. Uh, Starfish has been in existence since April of 2018. So it basically came into existence because the community needed a physical space. So just um, look around. I want to start with a simple survey. Who here is actively building blockchain products? OK, pretty much everybody. Who here is actively looking to invest in blockchain products? Who here is on the business side? Who here is on marketing? Who here is legal? Legal.io, OK, good. They're a member company. Uh, so the beautiful thing about Starfish is it's a physical space to come together to build Web3 tech. And this is a really special place. And I've, many of you have probably traveled around. This is, San Francisco is very lucky to have a space like this. So I uh, just want to give you um, a little overview of what we do. We have dedicated office spaces for small startups, anywhere from two people to 10 people. We also have floating uh, co-working desks. And we also host events like this, um, free to the public, but also um, hosting for other events. I don't want to give away too much. You can check us out, starfish.network. Uh, ask me any questions and follow us on Twitter at starfishsf. We're live streaming this. So you can go on YouTube and subscribe to Starfish Network. Uh, but we're basically trying to create a bigger megaphone to get these projects that people are working on out into the, the wild because a product with no users is um, just a waste of time. So. I want to welcome Grant, who's going to um, basically be moderating this event, uh, also the host of the SF F Dev Meetup Group, so very happy to have him here. Uh, thank you, Grant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so uh, I just want to kick it off with a quick announcement. Next week, we're having an event with a very special guest speaker. Can't say who it is, but if you're available um, next Wednesday, stop on by, same location. Um, also, uh, I'd like to, b before we get started, if anyone's looking for a job, um, DYDX is hiring. So Jillian, yeah, talk to her. Um, yeah, so anyway, without further ado, um, here's Antonio from DYDX. They are a decentralized um, protocol for financial products. So should be very cool to learn more about them. Here you go, Antonio. All right, thanks so much for the intro. All right, cool. So today I'm going to go through a pretty technical talk on DYDX um, and kind of how some of our smart contracts are architected. Um, so we can go right into it. So first of all, yeah, DYDX is a decentralized exchange for margin trading. So what is margin trading, you might ask? Margin trading is just trading with borrowed funds. So this basically allows you to short or get leverage when you're trading. Short selling makes you money when the price goes down, um, and leverage kind of multiplies your gains or losses when you're trading. So how does short selling work? So let's just go through an example in the real world. So say you think the price of Apple is going to go down. Uh, you can basically borrow a share of Apple from somebody um, and then sell that share of Apple um, for $500 and you put up $250 yourself. Um, so now in your margin accounts you have $750. So basically the $250 that you put up yourself and then the $500 that you got from selling the one share of Apple that you borrowed. Um, but you still owe one share of Apple back to the lender. Um, so now let's suppose that the price of Apple goes from $500 to $400. You still owe that one share of Apple back to the lender, but now you can buy it back for $400, whereas you initially sold it for $500. Um, so basically, you take $400 of the $750 that you have in your margin account, buy back the share of Apple, give it back to the lender, you get $350. So you basically made $100 when the price of Apple dropped from $500 to $400. And that really simply is just short selling. Um, so now how does leverage trading work? Um, so leverage trading, like I was saying, basically just multiplies your gains or losses that you get from trading an asset. 
So if you go like leverage long 2x Bitcoin, if the price of Bitcoin goes up 10%, you make 20%. Conversely, if the price of Bitcoin goes down 10%, then you lose 20%. Um, but let's just go through an example of how leverage trading works with uh, a share of Apple. So basically, instead of borrowing Apple this time, you're going to borrow dollars. So you're going to borrow $250 from a lender. You're again going to put up $250 yourself, and then you're going to take that $500 and buy a share of Apple um, from an exchange. And you'll put that share of Apple in your margin account but you still owe $250 to the lender. Um, but you could, right, if you had only bought uh, Apple directly with your $250, you could have only afforded to buy half a share of Apple, but now you have access to uh, the rewards of an entire share. Now, if you're closing your position, um, say the price of Apple goes from 500 to 600, so you can now sell your share of Apple that you have in your margin account, for $600, you still owe the lender back $250. So now you get $350 from this trade. And that's basically, you made $100 on this trade, whereas if you had only bought the half a share of Apple, you would have only made a profit of $50 on the trade. So like I was saying, you basically were leveraged long 2x on Apple. So you made twice as much money as you would have made if you had only bought the shares of Apple directly. So that really simply is margin trading. Uh, yes, go ahead. What was the cost of the loan? Sorry, what was that? The cost of the loan, what was it? Yes, so one thing I did ignore in, in this example is the interest that you have to pay to the lenders um, when you're margin trading. So people are not just gonna lend you money or shares of Apple for free. Um, and there is some interest rate normally that's kind of dictated by the market that you have to pay when you're borrowing an asset, whether that's dollars or Apple or Ethereum or whatever. Um, so you'll likely, if you borrow two, $250 today and in a week you close it, maybe you have to pay them back like $260. I ignored that in this example, but you're right. You also have to factor that into account when you are margin trading. Um, okay, so that was margin trading in the real world. So now we can go through how uh, short selling works with DYDX. So say you're selling short one ETH. Um, so in this example, the, the role of kind of the margin accounts is replaced by the DYDX smart contract. And this is just a smart contract that runs on top of Ethereum. Um, and then we'll still have an exchange where we can basically buy and sell assets. So say you want to short sell one ETH. Instead of borrowing one Apple, this time you're just going to borrow one ETH from the lender. Um, and on the blockchain, you can't uh, touch real dollars. So we're going to use a stable coin, uh, everyone's favorite stable coin, DAI, um, to basically fulfill the role of, uh, of dollars. Um, so we're gonna borrow one ETH from the lender and then put up 50 DAI as collateral. Um, say the price of ETH is 100 DAI, so we sell that one ETH for 100 DAI, and then we get 150 DAI locked up in the smart contract. Um, but we still owe back one ETH to the lender. Um, so just finishing this out, if we were to say now the price of ETH goes down, so you were right, goes down to 75 DAI, now we can trade 75 of that 150 DAI that we have locked up in the smart contract for one ETH, give that back to the lender, again, ignoring interest fees, and then we get the 75 DAI that's left. So we made 25 DAI when the price of ETH dropped from 100 to 75. And that just really simply is how short selling works at a very high level on DYDX. And we can kind of see how some of the, these intermediaries in the centralized financial world, so like a, a brokerage or an exchange that might normally hold your mar margin account, is kind of replaced by a smart contract in this new decentralized financial world. Um, okay, so some issues with this. Um, how does a smart contract trade on an exchange? Uh, smart contracts can't just go about like calling normal exchange APIs. And normally on a centralized exchange, you have to like deposit funds and all this nonsense before you can actually trade. Um, so that's the first problem. Uh, second problem is what happens if the price of ETH goes up? So in this example, I kind of ignored like, okay, well, what if the price of ETH goes to like 200 DAI and we don't have the money to pay for it? Like what happens? Um, so how does a smart contract chain trade? Uh, it uses a decentralized exchange. So one of the lovely things about Ethereum is that smart contracts can call other smart contracts. 
Um, and this is really powerful. Um, so the way that DYDX uses this is we plug into other decentralized exchanges that run on top of Ethereum. So in our example, right, for the part where, say, we traded like uh, 70, uh, 75 DAI, that should say DAI, for like one rep, um, basically we would call into the Xerox smart contract and then give it the 75 DAI and, and get one rep back. Um, so how does this, this is a little bit more technical, but how does this work at, at kind of a technical level? It's basically in Solidity, you will actually, our smart contract knows the address of the Xerox exchange contract, and then we'll call the fill order function on uh, the Xerox exchange contract, and that will basically execute the trade for us. So directly in the code, you can basically just call other smart contracts as if they were libraries you could interact with directly in your code and Ethereum kind of makes all of that magic happen to where our smart contract is calling a totally different set of smart contracts on the blockchain. Um, okay, so that's cool. Um, next problem is how do we trade on multiple uh, decentralized exchanges or DEXs for short? Um, there are many decentralized exchanges out there. It's not just 0x. So there are things like Oasis DEX, Kyber, Uniswap, like tons of other ones I'm sure. Um, and each one of the problems is each smart contract has a different interface. So back here, it's a little small, but kind of if you can see it, it's like a very specific function that we're calling. It's this like fill or kill order function on the 0x exchange contract. It has like a very set, specific set of parameters that we have to call. Well, how are we going to like hard, how are we going to like code the ability to talk to all these different set of smart contracts um, into our smart contract? Um, one of the main problems with smart contracts is that you can't change them once you deploy them. So like when you deploy a smart contract, we can't just like upgrade it with the ability to now support Uniswap, which just came out like last month or something. Um, smart contracts, or sorry, uh, decentralized exchanges are different. So like some of them require off-chain data to be passed in. So Xerox, for example, the way Xerox works is um, say I want to sell somebody like one ETH for 100 DAI. I make a message that basically signals my intent to do that. Um, it's just like a JSON blob which will say like the maker amount is 100, like taker amount is one. Um, and then I'll sign that with my private key. And then those signed messages which are just intents to trade are accumulated on relayers. And if somebody wants to actually take my trade, they'll have to present that signed message to the blockchain. Otherwise, the trade will not be able to be executed. Uh, conversely, some exchanges are totally on-chain. So things like Uniswap, there is no off-chain data that you basically really need to pass in. It's just like all of the uh, liquidity exists on-chain. For like Oasis Dex, there are actual orders that are stored on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and then people can come and take them. So my point here is that just like all of these exchanges are like very different. So how do we make like a general system that can plug into any one of them? Um, the next important thing is like how do we know the addresses of the exchange contracts? So like how do we know like what address is like the real 0x and make sure that we aren't like uh, using a fake like 0x exchange contract? It's, this is actually harder than it seems. Actually one of the hardest parts of programming smart contracts in Solidity is authorization. So like who gets to say that this is the address of like the real 0x contract? Say we had a system where like uh, arbitrarily, the DYDX core team could kind of add additional decentralized exchanges, um, which we basically allowed our users to trade on. Well, like, what if some other uh, decentralized exchange out there wanted to add their decentralized exchange to be on top of DYDX? They would have to come and get our permission to do that. But we're all about decentralized, like, open finance here. You shouldn't need anybody's permission to do what you want to do and, and build a new financial product. So how can we allow, basically, anybody out there to upgrade our own smart contracts um, and do that in a totally safe way? So we came up with this abstraction called an exchange wrapper. Um, so what an exchange wrapper is, is basically it wraps uh, the interface of any given decentralized exchange and gives it a common interface. Um, so we can kind of look really briefly, uh, it's hard to see, but like what that looks like here. So there are kind of two functions on this, and one of them is exchange. So just like I want to trade some asset for another asset, 
And that's basically like any decentralized exchange should be able to fulfill this function of like trading like token A for token B in like a certain amount. And then just the second uh, function on here is like get me the price or the cost to trade like token A for token B. So now we can just uh, plug this into our main smart contract. So all our main smart contract needs to know is how to interact with this common interface that we have in exchange wrapper. And then we can deploy different types of exchange wrappers for all of the different decentralized exchanges. Um, so one, the next important part, and I alluded to this before, is this doesn't really solve the problem of like who gets to say like which exchange wrappers you can use. The way DYDX solves that is that the actual end users will pass in the address of the exchange wrapper that they want to use. Um, so they'll like pass this in any time they want to make a transaction. So say you want to like uh, do your buy or sell uh, through 0x when you're making a DYDX short sell, you'd pass in the address of the 0x exchange contract every time you want to do that. And that's important because you don't need anybody's permission. You don't need like our permission to kind of whitelist a certain amount of addresses um, that are able to be traded on by the platform. Um, and then the, the DYDX contract basically just validates that it actually received the funds. So the two functions that I mentioned before were basically like do the trade and like get the cost of the trade. So the DYDX smart contract will just ask the exchange wrapper, okay, what is the cost to do this trade? And then it'll call actually do the trade. And then the exchange wrapper will send it some money back. And then our smart contracts will validate that it actually received the money. And like from DYDX's point of view, we don't care about anything else, right? Like all we care about is that we gave you some assets and you gave us some back. Um, so that's the only thing that we need to validate. We don't care if you called like 100 other smart contracts like in your call stack when, when you actually were trying to do this trade. So we're basically like agnostic to how like all of these decentralized exchanges are actually implemented. Um, okay, so this is just a really quick diagram of kind of how the state of the world works. So there's DYDX, like our smart contracts, there's some end user, there's all these actual decentralized exchanges like 0x, Oasis Dex, Uniswap, and then for each one of those we'll have an exchange wrapper which will basically sit in front of it. Um, so say the user wants to trade DAI for rep on Uniswap. So on the right here, the thing, first thing is that they'll pass in in an actual transaction that they send to the blockchain are the address of the exchange wrapper, so the address of the Uniswap exchange wrapper, and then any order data that Uniswap might need to uh, execute that trade. And then DYDX, our smart contracts will see that, and they'll basically call the exchange function on the Uniswap exchange wrapper. Uh, they'll send it 75 DAI and call the function and be like, please give me one rep back. Uh, the Uniswap exchange wrapper will call actual Uniswap and will trade the 75 DAI that it just got from DYDX for the one rep. And then the Uniswap exchange wrapper will send that back to DYDX and will validate that we did in fact receive one rep for this trade. Um, so that's kind of how the entire call stack of using these exchange wrappers works. Um, this is a little technical, but kind of if you wanted to get an idea of like what one of these exchange wrappers looked like, this is our exchange wrapper for 0x. Uh, so on the left, basically, it'll we pass in all the order data as bytes. So that's just kind of like an unstructured array of like bytes, and we need to like parse that into something that's like manageable. So on the right, you'll see this is basically us in assembly language because Solidity is awesome. Uh, parsing like the bytes into a zero x order, so like parsing out like the tokens that are being traded, like the amounts and all that stuff of the order, um, and then we send that on to zero x in a format that they can understand. On the left is the exchange function, so it's like first of all we like parse the zero x order out of the bytes, then it's kind of we transfer the tokens to zero x. Uh, then we actually call 0x to do the trade, and then we kind of transfer the tokens back to DYDX. Uh, but these exchange wrappers, the other interesting thing about them is they're totally general. Like, it's an interesting concept. It can be used by like a lot of different types of smart contracts, like not just DYDX. So if you are building a smart contract where you need some kind of exchange functionality, but you don't necessarily want to tie yourself to like always using 0x or like always using Kyber, 
uh, you can use this kind of exchange wrapper abstraction where you can kind of let your users pass in the exchanges they want to use, let your users pass in the data, um, and then you can plug into any other exchange. This is also really important, even if you aren't like necessarily trying to get other people to build on top of your protocol, it's really important for upgrading. So like for us, like 0x upgraded from like version one to like version two. It's like, okay, well, how do we like DYDX like upgrade from 0x version one to version two? Well, it was really easy. All we did is like deploy a new 0x exchange wrapper, pointed our front end to like at the address of the new version two 0x exchange wrapper, and then it, we just like upgraded right after that. Um, we've had cases where like some DEXs will like get like security vulnerabilities or something like that and have to upgrade like really quickly. Um, and this allows us to like upgrade like immediately basically, like as soon as we can up, like basically deploy the exchange wrapper to the blockchain. And then you just change your uh, front end to basically point at the address of the new exchange wrapper. Um, so I'll stop there for now. Does anybody have questions on the exchange wrappers? Yeah. Um, yeah, I will talk, how about I'll talk about that at the end, um, and I promise I will, um, but just kind of want to focus on some of the technical stuff right now. Uh, cool, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the question was, what is the percentage of assembly code in our Solidity code base? Our opinion is that we try to keep it like as limited as possible. Uh, one of the really important things that we focus on a lot um, for our smart contracts is readability um, and the ability for other people to understand what we're doing. Uh, so we focus like a lot on like even stuff like variable names, like what should the name of this function be, like what should the name of this variable be, and we think it's very important for like the community, like auditors, like everybody else to very transparently like see what's going on in the code. And assembly is like a little bit of like the antithesis of that. Uh, so we definitely try to keep it to a minimum. But I mean, just in general, there are some things that straight up like Solidity doesn't let you do that the EVM does let you do. And those are kind of the only times where we'll go and like actually use some assembly. That's a good question though. Yeah. Hold on. Wait, Mike. <laughs> so this is more a financial question, but you know, it, it, if you say short a futures contract or a stock, right, an exchange will require a margin, right, such that it will guarantee the, the counterparty will get their funds. How do you do that in this, in this environment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that goes a little bit farther back to kind of my example here. Um, but say you wanted to short sell one ETH in this example. Um, so as part of that trade, uh, we're not gonna let you just borrow ETH without putting up some collateral. Uh, so you'll have to uh, put up basically 50 die of collateral as part of this transaction. And one of the really nice things about Ethereum is everything happens atomically. And what atomically means is that all of this happens or none of it happens. Um, so there's no way that you could basically borrow the one ETH without putting up the 50 die as collateral. Um, and that'll basically cover you if the, the price basically goes up like 50% in this example. Um, so in, in our example, our margin trading is a little bit different than normal margin trading. In normal margin trading, you basically have unlimited losses. Uh, in our margin trading, you can, your losses are limited by the collateral that you put up. Uh, so it has a little bit different economics, but this is kind of the second thing that I'm gonna talk about, is like what happens uh, when you get a margin call. Got it. So it, it, maybe the second question on that is, why do you need the lender at all? Why can't it just be using that if that's the case, right? If you're, if you're sort of limiting the, because the stock loss is sort of inherent in the contract, why do you need, why do you need sort of Yeah, that's what we chose to focus on, basically physical delivery. I mean, you can definitely make like synthetic derivatives using like Augur or something like that if you wanted to. We chose to do it this way. We think it's just a little bit easier, basically. Um, and, and basically, it, it has a little bit less centralization. So like a lot of the oracles out there right now are like fairly centralized. So like the, the classic way to like make like a, a futures contract is like, all right, I'm long, like you're short, like we both lock up like 50 die, and then like some oracle tells us like the price like tomorrow, um, and then we like split the money like after that. This is like a little bit different of a financial product where we're actually doing margin trading. We can actually tap into kind of the underlying spot market for like the ETH to die market for which there is like a reasonable amount of liquidity. Um, so that's basically the way we chose to do it is, is focus on like the actually like physically delivered uh, types of financial products to start. Let's say more questions. All right, sounds good. Let's, let's keep going.
All right, so we learned about exchange wrappers. Uh, cool, so second question, what happens if the price goes up, not down? So this is just our same situation from before where we have the smart contract with 150 DAI, but now the price of ETH is 200 DAI, and we still owe one ETH back to the lender. So what do we do? We can't buy back one, nobody's gonna sell us one ETH for 150 DAI. Uh, so we just have to not get in this situation basically. So there, in uh, margin trading, there's this concept of a margin call, where if the price is moving against your trade, so you short it and it goes up, you go long and it goes down, uh, you will eventually get margin called. Um, and when that happens, the trader must close their position within a specified time limit or forfeit all of their collateral. So on Ethereum, basically the way, uh, or in our protocol, the way it works is once a margin call is put in, the trader has to come back and close their position or after like a certain amount of seconds, the lender can come and like seize that 150 die, which is probably worth more than the one ETH um, at the time of the margin call. Um, yeah. But okay, so this is pretty annoying for traders. What if like the margin call time is like an hour, but they're not online during that uh, time when they get margin called? Like, what do we do? So I'm gonna introduce like a really important concept to, to DYDX and I think like smart contracts in general. So the concept is that positions can be owned by smart contracts. One of the really cool things about Ethereum is that smart contracts are just denominated by addresses the same way as your MetaMask wallet or whatever is denominated by an Ethereum address. So from the perspective of the DYDX smart contract, it doesn't matter if like I personally own with my like MetaMask wallet, uh, my short position on DYDX, or if some other smart contract owns a short position on DYDX. And this is really cool because smart contracts are smart, <laughs> um, or at least basically allow you to uh, add additional functionality. Um, so we have this concept of a custodian smart contract, and that's just a smart contract that will own your position on your behalf. So from DYDX's point of view, all it knows and all it cares about is that like the custodian smart contract owns the short position. But if that custodian smart contract ever gets like a payout, so it gets like paid out like 50 DAI as the result of closing your short position, it'll forward all the profits to you. And you can like audit the code and be confident that yes, in fact, this custodian smart contract will in fact like pass on all the money to you. Um, so DYDX provides like a set of interfaces to basically ask the custodian smart contracts if it's okay for totally third parties, so just totally random people, like could be any address, to modify positions that they own. So we have this concept of, uh, this function is called close on behalf of. Um, so the way our smart contracts will work are, um, say there's a position that's owned by a custodian smart contract, uh, some third party calls into DYDX and asks to close that position. DYDX will see, well, hey, wait a minute, like this random person is not the owner of this uh, position. So it will basically call to the custodian smart contract. It will call this close on behalf of function and ask the custodian smart contract, is it okay if this random person closes your position, yes or no? And then the custodian smart contract will basically just return like yes or no. And this seems like kind of a random thing to have, but it's actually a really important concept um, and allows you to build like a lot of interesting things on top. Uh, yeah. Say uh, I know there's a big trade open uh, and I basically open up a, a bunch of small positions and basically lock up the time that there takes to execute a margin call successfully to get back all of your collateral. Is that something you deal with in the protocol? Um, not really because our protocol is like totally peer to peer. So it's not like pooled at all. So if you wanna like open up your tiny positions and have like some borrower that's like borrowing tiny positions from you, uh, then that's, there's not really any problem there. And I guess yeah. what I'm talking about is like the, I don't know what the time is to get the margin uh, call, but if I basically keep emitting small transactions and locking up all of the, uh, the gas limit in each block, eventually I could get your big- Oh, trade. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, you're right. And that's actually one of the things that borrowers need to keep track of. So the time for the margin call is specified like per position. 
So lenders will offer a specific loan with like a specific like time to answer a margin call. You're right. One of the attacks that we thought about was, okay, well on Ethereum, like you can just kind of fill up like all of every single block for like say the margin call time is like an hour. So you fill up literally all the blocks for that hour and then you can kind of stop that from being margin called. So this is one of the things we thought about in the protocol and kind of weighed the cost of literally filling up all the Ethereum blocks for an hour against like what could be your potential profit. But that's like a very good point. And this is like one of the things you have to think about when you're making smart contracts is basically economic attacks like this. That's personally like one of the reasons I really like like engineering for smart contracts because it's not just like tech. It's like you really have to think about like the economics of like what you're doing. And a lot of times we'll kind of make not like proofs, but at least like arguments as to like why that that type of attack exactly like we thought about this like wouldn't necessarily happen given certain parameters. Um, okay, on with the custodian smart contract stuff. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve is what if you get margin called, but you're not around to answer the margin call? Like, how can we solve that problem? So what we came up with is this custodian smart contract that will basically run a Dutch auction on your behalf to buy back the tokens that you owe to the lender and will send all of the profits to you. Uh, yeah. So the way this Dutch auction works is at time zero, so right after you get margin called, um, the Dutch auction custodian will offer to buy back the tokens that you owe to the lender. So say we owe one ETH to the lender for nothing. And it will be like, hey world, do you want to sell me like one ETH for nothing? And world will say, no, I don't want to sell you one ETH for nothing. Um, but then over time, it will increase the price that it's offering. Uh, to 100% of the collateral that's locked in the position. Um, and this is important because once the price of the Dutch auction crosses the market price, there will be an arbitrage opportunity where basically somebody can come and uh, say the price of ETH is 125, but our Dutch auction price is 130. So now we're sitting saying like, hey world, do you want to sell us an ETH for like 130? And world is like, yes, I would love to sell you one ETH for 130 because the market price is 125, so I can just straight up make like five die of free money. Um, so that's basically what we do with this Dutch auction custodian contract. Um, and the way it works, so we just have uh, in, in different places like a normal DYDX margin trade, um, but we have this custodian that owns the position on the user's behalf. So this bidder, which is just like a totally random person out there on Ethereum, it will call into DYDX uh, directly and ask like, hey, I want to close this position. DYDX will say, hey, wait a minute, you're not the owner of this position. Let me ask the custodian contract using this close on behalf of interface that we have. And the Dutch auction custodian will look at its auction price, look at the amount of funds that the bidder has sent, and see if it's greater than the current price that it's offering. And if all of that is the case, then we'll take the one rep from the bidder. They get the auction price of 130. Uh, the lender uh, basically gets that one rep, rep, rep back, so they're happy. Um, then we have 20 DAI left over, which is sent to, from DYDX's perspective, that's set into the custodian smart contract. And then that custodian smart contract, since it's just code, forwards on the 20 die to the actual trader. Uh, one other like super cool thing you can do with this is a bidder doesn't even necessarily have to have the money themselves. So they can atomically within one transaction buy the one rep. So say like uh, Oasis Dex is off out there offering to trade like uh, one rep for 125 die. Within the scope of one transaction, this bidder can call into DYDX and say, like, hey, DYDX, Oasis Dex is offering to sell for 125. Why don't you go buy it from them? So then DYDX will buy it from Oasis Dex, give the one rep back to the lender, um, and then the bidder will make five die of totally risk-free profit. Like, they didn't need to put up any capital to, to be able to make this arbitrage opportunity. And then, again, same as last time, the uh, custodian will send back the 20 die to the trader. Um, so one of the main products that DYDX offers is this concept called a short or leveraged token. And these are just standard ERC-20 tokens, which basically represents a short or leveraged position on an underlying asset. So the two that we offer right now are we basically offer a short Ethereum token. And the best way to think about it is like you own one short Ethereum token, Ethereum goes down by a dollar, then short Ethereum goes up by a dollar. Um, or leveraged Ethereum, it's basically just moves at some multiple of the price of Ethereum. 
Um, this is cool because now lots of, there are lots of exchanges out there that are set up to trade ERC-20 tokens. And all of the stuff we just talked about is like pretty complicated, right? Like it requires like borrowing from a lender, like sending these specific transactions to the blockchain. But what if you could just get short exposure by buying an ERC-20 token? And you could do this on like any exchange you might already be trading on. So let's make a position custodian contract that lets multiple token holders basically own different chunks of this backing margin position. So the way a uh, short token works is our short token contract just is a regular position custodian. So from DYDX's perspective, all it knows is that there is this short position and that the short Ethereum token owns it. But the short Ethereum token then just issues regular ERC-20 tokens, and all these actual token holders own different fractions of this short position. So say I like own 20 tokens and there are 100 outstanding, then I own one-fifth of the backing short position on DYDX. Um, Yes, and the reason that short tokens have value is that short token holders can destroy their tokens at any time to receive the payout from closing their share of the position. So again, I own 20 tokens, which is one fifth of the total supply. I can destroy those 20 tokens to close one fifth of the backing position and receive the appropriate payout. And because you can do that at any time, the price of the token should always trade higher than that or there'd be an arbitrage opportunity. Um, so this is just a diagram kind of showing exactly what I was talking about. So say I'm a short token holder, I called a DYDX to partially close my position. Again, using the same close on behalf of function where DYDX acts, asks the uh, short token contract, hey, is it okay for this random person to close this position? And then the short token contract will look in its state and see that, oh yes, oh, this yeah. person this does own 20 of these tokens, so it's fine for them to close the position. And as part of this, I'm going to destroy their 20 tokens. And then uh, that token holder will just close the position as normal and receive the appropriate payout. Uh, similarly, anybody can mint new short tokens by adding on to the position that backs the short token. Uh, so say there's some new person which is not a short token holder, they can call to DYDX to uh, say they want to increase the size of this uh, backing short position. They want to basically like put up more collateral. Um, so then DYDX, same thing, will say, oh, this random person doesn't own this short position, let me ask the short token. Uh, then the short token will see that this random person is trying to increase the supply. It will mint them brand new tokens, um, and then it will let them go on with uh, basically increasing the size of the position. So this is just uh, another example of how this concept of a position custodian can be really valuable um, in terms of adding new functionality to the protocol. And it has a lot of the same concepts as like what I was talking about before, like anybody could have built a short token on top of DYDX. Like it didn't have to be us. Like this literally requires no special permissions like from the actual base protocol itself. And that like really is the powerful concept that like anybody can build like these types of uh, financial tools. Like you have an idea for something you want to build on top of DYDX, like go build it. You don't need our permission. You don't need like an API key or anything like that. Just like go make your smart contract, use the interfaces that we've provided and make interesting financial tools. Um, cool. Uh, just kind of wanted to talk about one uh, extra thing, which I thought was interesting, but is not necessarily related to DYDX. Uh, one like really interesting just engineering problem in general we ran into as we were building this is how do you offer continuously compounded interest on the blockchain? Um, so the way the formula for continuously compounded interest is you basically take E like the special math number and raise it to like the rate times time. So like sweet so sounds interesting like if I had a normal computer I could literally just take like E to like to the power of RT. But blockchain is not a normal computer it doesn't do floats or anything like that. So how, and it doesn't support exponentials, so like how do we calculate e to the rt? Um, so in general, there's this concept of like an infinite series. So in general, we can approximate e to the x as like uh, what you see here. So like one plus like x over one factorial plus like blah, blah, blah. And if we keep like doing this with enough terms, we'll basically approximate very exactly like what e to the x is. So great, let's just like, we can implement that in solidity, right? Like these are all integers, so I'll just like take x to like a certain power, um, then I'll like put it over the, the one factorial, uh, et cetera. But the problem is like this is really expensive to uh, compute on a gas perspective. 
Um, and it's also like not really that accurate for larger values of, of x. So like if the exponent is like too large, like our interest is going to be pretty off. And that can cause like real problems for the protocol, right? Like if we think like a, a lender is owed like less money than they should be owed, or we think a thing is like certain amount of collateralization, or the interest rate is uh, changing in like weird ways, that's that's like actually could have some security implications for the underlying base protocol. Uh, so can we do better? So what, basically what we came up with is we stored the values of e to various powers. Um, so we stored like the value of e to one half, like e to one fourth, e to one eighth, and like down for like 20 times. And then you basically just binary search uh, for the next biggest exponent, less than x. So say we're trying to like calculate like the value of like e to the 0.6. Okay, well the first one like 0.6 is greater than one half, so we'll take that one. Um, uh, then our remainder is like 0.1, so then we just like binary search for the next number, which is like less than like our current remainder, and then we take that if it happens. So we basically came up with this logarithmic algorithm to kind of find all these like factors of e and then sum them up, um, and which has came out turned out to be like really efficient and quite accurate. Um, so sweet, uh, can we do like even better than that? So the first part of this is like, say you had like e to the 0.67. So you like find all these factors of e, which are like e to like various, like one half to the power of like whatever. Uh, then you like sum all those up. That's like pretty, pretty fast and easy because we literally just stored like 20 of these and we hard coded them in our smart contract. So it's just literally like pulling things out of memory, which like isn't that expensive. Uh, then we have like some little remainder after that, which is like our error. So like after all of these, like uh, the first four terms, we came up with like a remainder of like 0 0.0059. So like what's e to the 0 0.0059? Well, sweet, our friend the infinite series there is like here to help us approximate the value of e to like the power of small numbers. So let's just do like a very small amount of terms of the infinite series with that amount. Um, and then we came up with this function where we basically do the two of these things together. And this is actually pretty cheap to implement and it's accurate to uh, 18 decimal places, which is more accurate than the exponential function in JavaScript. And it only costs like five to 10,000 gas. <laughs> so it's, it's not that good. Um, but just wanted to present this as like, there are lots of interesting challenges that you will see if you're trying to engineer on Solidity or using decentralized systems that you just wouldn't even think about if you weren't like uh, actually in it. Like, who really cares about, like, what, what would you do if you had a computer that, like, couldn't deal with fractions or, like, couldn't, like, raise exponentials? Well, you have to come up with, like, interesting stuff like this. So this is the kind of stuff that we're working on at DYDX. Uh, hopefully this was helpful uh, and impactful to, to see. Um, so I'll stop there for questions. Do want to mention that we are hiring engineers at all levels of the stack. So if any of this sounded interesting to you, uh, come and talk to us after this. And yeah, I'll take questions now if you guys have any. So awesome presentation, by the way. Uh, given that you guys are working with financial contracts, how do you actually use floating point numbers or how do you deal with the math? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we don't do floating point numbers. Another thing that we implemented as part of this is our own fraction library. So we basically represent like any floating point numbers as like fractions. Um, one of the nice things about uh, Solidity slash the EVM is that everything operates on like 32 bytes, which is like a ton of bytes to be storing like an integer in. So you actually can store like really big numbers. So we basically approximate like floats as like some really big number over like some other really big number and then have like uh, abstractions to do like operations on those two fractions against each other. All right, cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, when people um, engage in your either margin, either short or leverage trades, who sets the margin? Yes, this is a good question. Um, so in our protocol, the lenders set the margin. Um, so it's basically on them to like, you could offer a really small margin, which would kind of be a riskier loan. So you could offer like a smaller margin, but maybe higher interest fees, or you could offer like a really safe margin with like lower interest fees. So it's, it's really like up to, the protocol doesn't really specify anything by itself. It's kind of all up to the users about like how they want to use the protocol. Hi, great presentation. I'm wondering if you see uh, users competing with gas price uh, in the Dutch auction. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, right now it's like not that competitive because like people don't know about it. But game theoretically, like absolutely, you're right. Like once the auction price like crossed, like so so basically like to make it worth it, you would have like the auction price would have already been uh, past like the market price plus the gas fee. Um, but if like everybody's trying to compete and like fill this thing at the same time, maybe during those times of like bidding, the the um, the, like the gas price will increase if everybody's like trying to get into that same block to like fill this arbitrage opportunity. Um, from the protocol's perspective, that's not like the end of the world because like all we want to do is like get the best price for the users. But yeah, absolutely, that that would probably happen. Um, hi, um, I just want to ask you: uh, Do you support any off-chain collaterals? Because you mentioned about Apple shares and stuff like that. Yeah, right now we don't. So our protocol basically only supports ERC twenty tokens, like on-chain on Ethereum at this time. That could be interesting in the future for us to support, though the way I see this playing out is likely other assets will be tokenized on top of Ethereum. So like you could have like EOS token on top of Ethereum and maybe you have like some like atomic swap like two-way thing uh, where you can go back and forth between them and then we would just live in our happy world of like only interacting with ERC20 tokens. It's possible that doesn't happen, and we could, we're kind of like looking into ways to support assets on other chains in the future. So, do you have any Oracle system to report um, tracking this, uh, the price feeds of these uh, collaterals? Uh, we don't have any Oracles right now. Um, we basically don't need them because the actual like lenders will set like all the parameters for like the collateral they're willing to accept and all this stuff. Um, but in, in the future, that's kind of something we're looking into as well. Uh, has your team thought about maybe um, enabling the person that is being margin called to post automatically post additional collateral? So if I have more collateral, I didn't post it initially, even though it's over collateralized. A smart contract could just automatically take. Yeah, absolutely, and that'd actually be like a really simple like custodian smart contract to write. Maybe it's like you have like a bunch of funds in your Ethereum wallet, and you like set allowance on them. Setting allowance in Ethereum basically just means you authorize some other address to spend your funds. Um, but basically, you you could have this custodian smart contract that if it were margin called, it would just pull funds from your wallet, deposit them in DYDX, and you can make that totally automated. But yeah, that's a great example of like something you could build like using some of these abstractions. So with, uh, with Cosmos and Polkadot coming online soon, what would happen if, uh, let's say there's like a short token that gets, that gets tokenized, put cross chain, goes and trades on some other chain, and gets margin called on the original chain. Uh, what do you expect to happen there? Yeah, so one of the cool things about short tokens is that uh, the short tokens don't like disappear once the position has been margin called and closed. They just basically stabilize on some value. So it's kind of like if you own a short position for a, a short token for a position that's been margin called and closed, uh, that position has been closed. So like the short token contract will have been paid out with like, say like a bunch of DAI. And then all of the token holders just have like pro rata uh, shares to like claim some of that DAI. So it's like the short token will just stabilize on like a value. It will always be like worth like 100 die or something now, and it will no longer track like a short position on ETH. Uh, last question. One more, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. So, what's your guys' uh, development roadmap right now? Like, where do you guys go from here? Yeah, absolutely. So right now we are basically building a second version of the protocol. Uh, one of the other unique things about DYDX, which I didn't really touch on in, uh, in this presentation, is that we've actually built a product on top of our protocol as well. So we're not just like sitting here building smart contracts. We're sitting here like building real products in the world and trying to get real people to use them, like actually build liquidity um, on our product. So next, we're basically building, we, we gathered a bunch of feedback from the first product, which is called Expo, which is kind of a brokerage for these short and leverage tokens. Um, and they're kind of building a second version of the, the product slash protocol right now. Uh, that's going to release in like, I don't know, like a month or something, or a little more. Um, and we will release more info about that very soon. Uh, cool. Well, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Okay, if the panelists would please come up. Um, we're gonna have a panel on the crypto winter next. Uh, yeah, so we can take a quick uh, bathroom break? Yeah, a ba quick bathroom break or stretch your legs or whatever. Here we go.